All right, welcome to another episode of No Investment Advice. We've got the NAI boys here today. Trung fan, me, Master Flex himself, Bloomberg opinion writer, and we have Jack Butcher, founder of Visualize Value. Always got the freshest merch on, mate. What's on your head there today? Is that a new one? We picked this up from a little uh, local merchant in Nashville this week, mate. <laughs> oh, an actual man. And you got the merch uh, jumper on as well, mate. Crunchy. Has this yeah, merchant... Is he not leveraging the power of the internet? Did you pitch him on the power of the internet? She, she. actually was in a, in a uh, thrift store, like a thrift convention thing that Celia took me to and uh, haven't pitched yet, but I'm going to go back and pitch. Okay, okay, good, good. Love that. All right. All right. So, boys, we got a lot to talk about this week. Um, so we're going to be talking about, the obviously, the Celsius meltdown that's coming up in a little bit. Is Celsius insolvent or not? We're gonna jump into that a little bit. Um, Jack Dorsey announced Web 5. We're all trying to wrap our heads around Web 3 and he, he took a few steps ahead. So we're gonna break that down. Jack's gonna give us an opinion on how he thinks they could have packaged it slightly differently. And then there's this Google AI stuff as well that Trunk's gonna give us the lowdown on. But first and foremost, mate, we gotta start with a meme of the week over to Trunk. What we got this week, mate? All right, amazing. Here we go. So our uh, our friend Nick Majuli, he was on here a couple episodes ago, uh, the COO of Ritz were Ritz Holtz Wealth Management. But uh, you know, Mark is getting <laughs> clapped on Monday, and he tweeted out this incredible statistic. <laughs> Obviously, uh, for the 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 listeners, it's a it's a return chart for the S and P five hundred on days that the McRib is available, the McDonald's McRib, and the days it's not available. So it looks like uh, uh, when the McDonald's McRib is not available, which is the majority of days, uh, 0 0.0.4 is the average daily return. It's double when the McRib is available. So think what you will about that, but I'll tell you what's hilarious about this uh, tweet. Nick writes, there's only one thing that can save the market now, which is obviously the McRib. But I love how he tagged McDonald's in the photo. <laughs> Yeah, this is how that is as advanced as most analysis on the internet goes with with investing. So, I think we can say that one is is definitely investment advice there, mate. Um, anything else there, boys? On on the meme of the week before we get over to some special segment that we have for people coming up. Not yet. No, we're good, man. We're uh, so just for the listeners and the viewers, uh, we're going to be hopping into a conversation I had with Turner Novak and Trevor Rainbolt. Uh, uh, Turner Novak's our VC buddy, uh, and Trevor Rainbow is a professional Google Maps player. So you'll Trump, find out. Can you tell us what the hell? Wait, before people get into that madness, man, because I watched a few of these clips on TikTok. This is the most insane level of content I've ever seen. It's just. It's ridiculous. It's we, like Giga Brain on next level. So, yeah. what could you tee up? What exactly is a Google Maps player? So, there's a game called GeoGuessr, and the thrust of it is. Uh, and if you saw the tweet, you would know is basically uh, Trevor can look at an image for 0.1 second and figure out where in the world it is. And it's because he's trained his brain for this game GeoGuessr. So but as you, as you hear in our podcast, it is very specific to the game GeoGuessr. Like I tried to show him random images I pulled from the internet. And he's like, it's not the same because uh, you, we'll, we'll find on the episode, but I'll give a tease for the audiences. Uh, there are certain things like curbs streets and like post signs which are critical and obviously if i'm just taking a picture of somebody's house in vancouver it's not going to have all those things so like there are certain parameters but he explains it. what what i find super interesting about the conversation and uh, we'll, we'll drop it uh, right after this is uh the difference between the tiktok and twitter reactions is hilarious because this content was made for tiktok it's very yeah. visual it's very like uh, you rewatch it over and over again to really understand. Yeah, you're looking for the clues. It's like yeah. a game, like you're part of the game. Exactly. It's very TikTok native. Uh, so we talk about that, but then he breaks down like how he got so good at it. And uh, he tells us he's not even like the best in the world or even close to the best. And, uh, but he explains how you can get good. But anyways, I think the listeners will enjoy it. And the reason we wanted to drop it first here is if you saw it, it was super topical in the sense of it completely ripped through the internet. Uh, we were talking, our boy Turner had, 40 million impressions on Twitter on it. And the guy's got 600,000 TikTok followers. So uh, 
uh, it's a it's a juicy edge of the internet. But as Bilal said it in our group chat, a different edge of the internet. Yeah, it's because sometimes I think people think edge of the internet is only degening on uh, NFTs and D DeFi when there's actually a lot more. Especially nowadays, we need to distract ourselves. So yeah. Um, so why don't we go over to that right now? And if you're um, looking for the Celsius Web Five stuff, hang around till after after that uh, conversation with Trunk, and it's um, in an in an hour or so. We'll see you there as well. Awesome, thanks, guys. All right, welcome to the Not Investment Advice Podcast. Uh, this is a little bit different. No Jack Butcher, no Bilal Zadie right now, but I got two other fine guests and gentlemen. We got Trevor Rainbolt, who you may have seen from such viral videos as Turner Novak's tweet from last week that went absolutely nuclear. So just to set the table, uh, Trevor, uh, who has, by the way, an incredible last name, uh, is a TikTok, uh, uh, I guess, celebrity at this point with 570,000 followers. Is that right? Just about, yeah. And that's in six months. Yeah, in just over six months, yeah. Okay, and you and you gained that following by being uh, what is probably known as a Google Maps professional Google Maps player. Is that is that broadly right? That's broadly right. Yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> okay, and then Turner Novak uh, is uh, the internet's favorite uh, shit posting venture capitalist, and uh, Turner is huge into TikTok, and he has been. He, Turner actually, I think, within the tech Twitter community, is known as a guy that's most tapped in the TikTok of one of them. So, Turner, can you tell us about? First of all, when you saw this, when was the first time you saw Trevor's video? Uh, what compelled you to bring it over to Twitter? And then it's the most nuclear video you've ever had, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm trying to remember, I honestly don't remember when I first saw the videos, but I was just like, what is this? This is insane. Like, what is this thing? He like looks, he sees a picture and he figures out where in the world it is, right? I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. And it's almost like um, I kind of think about the evolution that caused me to actually post the video on Twitter. It's like uh, if you know, like the Jim McMahon meme or whatever, where he's like, it's like that he's like he's like face is like progressively getting more and more surprised as it goes, and like at the end he's just oh like, Vince McMahon, oh, yeah, Vince McMahon, yeah, yeah. So like I guess I was thinking about it like the first when you first see it, you're like, oh cool, he like figures out where he's at in the world with a picture, like that's pretty cool. And the next one is like. <laughs> You know, he's like, does it, it's like pixelated. He has like half a second to guess or whatever. I was like, oh, it's cool. It's cool. And then it's like blindfolded and you're like, whoa. And like your mind's like exploding. And then the last one, it's like finding a location in a music video based on like half a scene with like things moving around in the background. I was like, I remember seeing that. I was like, holy shit. This is like the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, and it's always been one of my favorite accounts on TikTok. And I just... I've been experimenting with this new format on Twitter where I reference something on TikTok and I just say, you know, this thing on TikTok. And I think that is sort of also like gets Twitter going because people on Twitter are like, oh, TikTok, like what's what's this? I got to check this out. So yeah, I just tweeted. I was just like, this is the most insane TikTok account I've ever seen or something. I forget what, how, what I worded it. You can pull, probably pull the tweet. No, it was, it was the and, most insane TikTok. Yeah. But what, what I actually want to ask Trevor is because Trevor, you've gone viral a million times on TikTok. And before we got on this recording, you had said the reactions on TikTok versus Twitter. Could you explain the reactions you saw and psychoanalyze the audiences? Yeah, definitely. I mean, going viral on TikTok, like it's it's like nothing new. It's like pretty much every video I post over a million views at this point. Um, but I've never tapped into the Twitter like demo, right? And once I did that, I knew like once you hit Twitter, that terms of like virality, that's a completely different you know, demographic completely than what you're getting on on TikTok and, you know, the, the younger kids where they're like, oh my God, this kid's my, this guy's my legend. I look up to this guy, you know, that's mostly comments. Like, can you find my dad? It's like bros, <laughs> bro, bros, like pillows, tells his pillow to be cold. Like that's a TikTok comments, right? It's just like Chuck Norris esque 2013 comments. Right. <laughs> um, and then you go to Twitter and I had this video that, you know, Turner posted that went completely viral. And it's like, you know, this guy's eyes are like creepy and like giving stalker vibes and you know, all this type of different, like analyzing my, like, you know, everything I'm doing and saying, and, you know, it's quite like a completely different reaction. I understand where they're coming from completely though, honestly. Um, Cause it is, you know, if you don't have context to what I'm posting on TikTok, it, it is easy to like, I think misconstrued kind of like my intentions. So um, I definitely understand where they're coming from. It's just funny to analyze like Twitter versus TikTok. You, I mean, you don't take it personally, do you? Like, I feel like you must have pretty thick skin from how visible you've already been in kind of the internet world. Yeah, I like, I know my character. So that's, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah. 
I feel like you, it's all edited in a, in a way that it's very good for TikTok. But if there's not like, I feel like there's some context when you see it on TikTok, like it's easier to like look at your other videos Mm -hmm. versus when you just see it on Twitter, like it's taken out of context. So it's a lot easier to just say, to have that reaction. Like, I think (laughs) my favorite was like the the people, like the women, they were like, I need a man like this or something. (laughs) Yeah, that, that was a funny reaction too. You got yeah, a lot of those. Yeah. Well, actually, to, the question I had for you, Turner, was because you understand these social platforms I mean, obviously way better than I do. Is like, is there something about that video itself and the type of content that uh, uh, Trevor's doing that is that's perfect for TikTok? Because it feels like it's a perfect uh, piece of consumable TikTok content. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah. I think the stuff that does well, that does the best in the TikTok algorithm, is things that make you rewatch it. And I think the editing on it is really crisp and tight. So it like makes you watch it again, but then also your mind's kind of blown. Like if you've never seen it before, you're kind of like, what the heck is this? And like, I think (laughs) the type of content, like the things that make something do well in the TikTok algorithm is like rewatching shares, going to someone's profile, watching other videos and like liking and commenting also. But I think like that type of video, just the way it's edited and just the type of content it is, just does really well in the algorithm. So I think it's perfect for TikTok, honestly. And it, and it's a really good, like if it does well on Twitter too, in the sense of like no context, like you can see this thing and be like, yo, this guy is like, this is crazy. He's like identifying, you know, random town in Nigeria just from like a picture. So I think, feel like overall, it's like really entertaining content, but TikTok specifically, the way it's like, it's like purpose built for TikTok. So Trevor, did you think about that? Cause I saw you like uh, your original stuff started in like last fall. Right. And then you obviously are a consumer of different social networks. Uh, how much time do you spend cutting one of these videos? And, and do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, I, th- I like, I, it's actually the easiest thing to do is to edit these because all I do is literally just cut out dead air. Um, so you like, you won't see like a single millisecond where it's like, I'm like breathing, right. Everything I'm doing is like, <laughs> It's either I'm zooming on the map, I'm saying Nigeria, Laos, you know, or it's, it's always con- like constant movement. Like, I don't want like a still frame in the video. Um, so like everything, even my intros, you'll notice if you look at like watch my intros, it's like guessing where I am. You know, it's like very like maybe a little too jumpy, but um, it's yeah, I, it doesn't take very long to edit them because I'm literally just cutting out, you know, dead air. Maybe that's why it's so unsettling for the Twitter sphere is like they're not used to these super insanely tight cut videos. And this, like you said, you're cutting out like every single breath between words, right? Yeah, it's uh, especially that one. Like even like the movement on that one, it was like I was Kim Burns or like zooming in super fast, zooming out, <laughs> zooming in, zooming left, right, like just constant movement. So like, yeah, I think things like that, it's, it's definitely very TikTok-y, but um well, yeah. could we uh, could we actually do something here? So I asked, uh, and you re and you retweeted that. So thank you. We did get a couple of uh, 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 images from people on Twitter. So like oh, for the listeners and the viewers here, the thing is this: Trevor in his TikToks can identify these images within a split second, like 0.1 second is one of his challenges. So so this uh, uh, Twitter user says this one could be tricky for Trevor. So, uh, do can I turn it off now? And could you tell me where this is? Um, this one is tricky for Trevor, um, yeah. but I think immediately the thing I I see there. Well, it was panned to the to the left. Immediately, what I usually go off of is the road. Okay. Um, we did have like architecture there. It felt Asian, I would okay. say. Um, and I think the stilts in front of the house. I usually think of um, like Indonesian type architecture there. Okay. Um, so I would probably go like Indo or somewhere in Southeast Asia there, but I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Okay, so that was Taiwan. You did the pick the region. Dude. Right? Oh, dude, I was. <laughs> All right, you're close. All right. So we're. Again, I think give me another, this is give me another one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you more because a couple of people said, oh, there's no way he's going to do this. So I just want you to get one of them, right? Just to be like, okay. So user UXSEC says, oh, this one might be difficult. There's no way he's going to get this one. All right, UXSEC, let's find out how confident you are with this photo. All right, we'll let, we'll let this no one pressure. hang a bit longer. Okay. All right. Dude, these guys are... <laughs> okay, so this is obviously Europe somewhere. Okay. I have nothing to go off, here, uh, off of here, though, at all. Uh, okay. Well, I'd, like to, uh, I'd love to hear you uh, think through it and explain why, like, your thought process. Yeah, so, I mean, just immediately this, the, you know, the foliage and this architecture is very European. Um, it's, like, very, st- like, tall building house here. It's... You're not going to find this anywhere in, like, the Americas or anything like that. 
We have a curb right here on the sidewalk. I don't know. Like it's like clipped. You can't even see the curb. Yeah. So I think this this goes into some interesting points that it brings up though, right? So the so oh, well, why don't you throw a guess out there? Uh I'll go uh let's go. I was giving like Easternish vibes. I don't think it's like France or Portugal or anything like that. I'll go it's not Baltic. I'll go I'll go like Ro, Romania. I'm not sure. Okay, it's Sweden, but okay. I, I like your thinking. I like nothing here. like Sweden, but I'll right. take it. <laughs> okay, so could you? So you threw some things out there, but when you see an image, what are the first four or five things you're looking at? Yeah, so immediately, you know, the road is the biggest thing. That's why those are probably more difficult because they were just panned to the left and the right where okay. you're looking strictly at uh, foliage and you know, architecture. Um, so immediately you're looking at road lines, road conditions, road length, um, like how wide it is, the quality of the road. You're looking at, um, you know, there's bollards on the side of the street, there's signage, there's language, there's, um, you know, obviously there's architecture and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, immediately. And there's also things we can get very into like the meta of the game too, but um, that's like, what's the meta hit the meta. Yeah. So, I mean, Google has, you know, laws or their own, the way they cover different countries. So there'll be things like, um, let's say like Nigeria, right? What the car, they use different cars in every country. So like, you know, what car Google drove in Nigeria, which helps more maybe sometimes than actual landscape. So there's very different things where it's like, you have to memorize like when they, when they took the footage or when they covered the actual country. So you're like, okay, you can base off the image quality of like, okay, well, I know Google didn't take coverage of this country in the last five years. So it's going to be a gen three camera, which means like 2013. Whoa. So it's like, okay, so I know which country has like, was covered in which years and like it, it, all these different things are like calculated when you're making educated guess. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a, that's a meta game. So the, uh, let me, uh, let me pull on one more thing on that meta game. Cause you did mention this in an early TikTok. I found it fascinating. You said that you knew the private, certain uh, countries have privacy laws that forced the way that uh, Google maps kind of did the imaging for them and that actually comes out as a tell in the in the uh the videos or in geoguessr the game right yeah so there's like a lot of different privacy like mainly i think the main ones are the the two main ones are um japan and switzerland which are like we call the it's called low cam um so basically you can tell if you're in like japan versus like um or like rural japan let's say in the middle of nowhere because you you can like tell your the camera is lower the google camera is lower uh let's assume it's switzerland due to um, privacy laws. So like when, when the, initially when Japan, um, covered in, or Japan was covered on Google maps or street view, um, they had to make complaints about the, the car being too high and looking over people's fences. So they had to recover the whole country lower, uh, for privacy reasons, same with Switzerland. So like, there's like meta things like that. We're like, okay, I'm feeling low. Like the camera you can tell is <laughs> low. So you're like, I'm being in Japan or Switzerland, or there's like some countries have follow cars, like police follow cars. So like, you can always see behind you is like in Tunisia, there's like a, a green car that follows you around um, because it's just to make sure that Google street view cars and doing anything sketchy or whatever it may be. Um, so the, there's a different, and then like in Vietnam, right? Like the, in the Vietnam, all, every single street view coverage in Vietnam is by a guy on a bike. Yeah. Um, so, so I lived in Saigon for five years that it, it, pretty good giveaway on the roads there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Vietnam is a, a really fun country to guess, honestly. Mainly because every single storefront has their address on it, so yeah. <laughs> you can uh, you can look pretty quickly on where you are. Well, how about this? I'm, I'm gonna I'll throw one more photo, but it's gonna have sidewalks and roads and signage. Okay, no pressure, and, uh, no pressure. <laughs> and then Turner, I think Turner has some questions around your origin story. All right, so all right, so here we go. Okay, yeah. So immediately here, we have a uh, dashed yellow outer lines. Um, we have. Yeah. So immediately, this is actually something I most recently learned. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting one, but the dash yellow outer lines are usually found in Ireland and the uh, New Zealand, but this doesn't look like either of those. Um, I think more recently I saw some of these dashed ye yellow outer lines in, uh, in Portugal, um, which makes me lean more towards Portugal here, but it also looks like I can't see that plate number, but um I don't think the, I don't, <laughs> they're the, sorry the plate color okay, um okay. so portugal has like a yellow uh rights on the right side of their other plates um but yeah i'll go or not portugal was it it was a uh, it was spain um 
I think that had the yellow. Letter. Yeah, so I would go Spain and Portugal there. Yeah, it's Spain. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so redemption on the third one. That's yeah. fantastic. And uh, you kind of walked through it. But uh, I'm going to throw the next question over to Turner. I know Turner's got a few burning his, uh, his wallet here. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, what was the first time you ever did GeoGuessr? Like, how did you find yeah. out about it? I've like way back, like I'm talking like, so I graduated high school in 2017. Um, and so like in 2016, I would say it was like one of those things, like in the back of the class, you're like, I'm <laughs> bored. Like I got nothing to do. I'm just gonna sit here and guess. Uh, and yeah. like back then I was like horrible. Like that's, what, I, I get that question asked a lot. It's like, is this like something you were born with? I like, I, I never had interest in geography at all. Like I, I generally suck at geography, like before any of this, like I was probably, I couldn't tell you anything about any countries. Um, and so it was just like a hobby in the back of class. I would use the past time, you know, waiting for school to end. Um, and then I kind of like, once I graduated, I kind of let go of it. And then once back in, I want to say 2021, I started again. I was just like a year in lockdown. I'm like, ah, I, I've seen it. it was picking up on the internet again. A couple of YouTubers were playing it and I was like, okay, I'm gonna give this a shot. And I think I have like somewhat of like an like obsessive personality. So like once I started, I was like, okay, I'm, mm, I yeah. am, I got really study and then here we are so so you took a break like you took a multi-year break from the game yeah i've only been doing this like consistently for like this is my like one year now like last june okay, okay so you said you graduated high school 2017 so you're probably like i don't know i don't know how old kids graduate like 23 like, 23, like yeah. plus or minus one year you've said in the past like i think one of the podcasts i listened to you said the best people this game are like 16 or like 15 so yeah. I feel like almost like you're almost I'm like, like your prime. Like you're gonna have to retire soon. <laughs> I got like five years in me. My tank is yeah. It's a uh, no. Like honestly though, like that's such a like I'm considered old in the community, and then that's like <laughs> that's the, amazing. Anyone like you ever see me one v one or like any anyone I play I, on my TikTok is like 15, 14, 16. Okay. They probably they'll um, probably get pumped when they get featured in one of those videos. Like do you ever shout them out? Yeah, like I'll tag them. Most of them are so modest though that they don't. They just play the game just to you know. Yeah, just to play and just to learn. And, you know, they're much better than I'll ever be candidly. Um, I also think it's like a part of it's like, once you're that young, it's you retain things a lot quicker. It's easier. It's like learning a language when you're younger is more beneficial than learning it. Now, oh, yeah. Right. For sure. Uh, I think it's the same like principle, but um, yeah. And there are still in the back, you can, you know, they're in their Chromebook in the back of class guessing away right now. I already know it. Um, <laughs> is, yeah. is, is the best player in that age range or, or is there somebody in their mid to uh, early thirties? That's actually the best quote unquote. The best player is 15. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, that this reminds crazy. me. Well, yeah, I, like, I played really competitive Halo back in, in high school and sort of in college. I mean, straight up, I like suck at video games now, but I was so good when I was like 16. That was like the best that I was probably when I was 17 was like the peak. And I think it's like that in most competitive esports, like competitive games, like the, the, like once you pass 20, you're considered old. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely like, I get memed on a lot for like being older in the community, <laughs> which is like pretty ironic. Right. But um, yeah, it's funny. Well, and you have, I mean, you, you, you mentioned in this previous call, podcast, I think it's profoundly uh, pointless was the mm -hmm. idea of like, so you, you run these communities. There are a lot of discords, right? You have, you have open discords and uh, how, I mean, how big is this community? And uh, yeah. yeah. So like give, give us a sense of that. Yeah. So there's one like pro discord where it's like, once you reach a certain level, uh, I would say it's like, there's so much basics you can learn in the game, but once you reach that ne ne next level, um, there's not like, I say pro player, but there's not like, I'm not getting paid for this. It's just kind of like a, a ironic, funny thing to say once you're really good type thing. Um, but yeah, I would say in the, in like the main discord, it's called Plonkit. It's probably, um, I would say less than a thousand, maybe 500 to 750 mm -hmm. active users. It is a, it does seem like a pretty niche skill that I think people think it's a, well, here's my question. Is it more applicable than we think it is or less applicable? Cause if you read through those Twitter comments, half of them were like, yo, when's the CIA going to hire this guy? <laughs> Dude, those are the funny, I would never like if the CIA gives me something to work on. I'd be like, I got no idea. Uh, honestly, as long as, as like, if it's not on Google street, you like candidly, okay. <laughs> like, I don't know about the country. <laughs> Yeah, which is like really sad to say. Like, there's a couple of instances where it's that's not the case, um, but like just candidly, like um, I t I take those compliments as like you know sincerely I do, and it means a lot. But I would be a very useless per like prospect for the CIA. 
somebody uh, wrote a uh, tweet wrote uh, this guy's about to get a max contract from the CFA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so back to the. It's been a year then, so twelve months you've taken it super seriously. So I kind of want to get into. I need to know the daily routine. I'm obsessed by like peak performance and like how people do it. So, how many hours a day are you playing or studying? And could you yeah. separate those two out? Do you actually yeah. have like binders full of images? Because I've seen the GeoHint is the website you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have those like printed out and like just kind of reading them before bed? Yeah. Or, like, what does the training look like? <laughs> That's a great question. I would say you asked me that question a year ago. It was like I was playing. If you, I mean, like on the weekends, it was nine, ten hours a day every weekend. Uh, where I obviously have more free time on the weekend. Um, I would sit here and just play games all day, every day, eight, nine hours. And that's where you kind of just pick up the general feel of countries um, of like, you know, the same way I could easily look at images and be like, oh, this is Europe, but I couldn't tell you where. And it's like, okay, this is obviously European. Um, and so, yeah, so like I would say eight, nine hours a day of just like playing in, in, in the initial like weekend phase, weekday phase, man, I would probably play like, I wake up, I would probably play an hour before work um, just because just keep your mind fresh. And then once, you know, I'm clocked out or whatever. I'm playing the rest of the night, probably three, four hours max. Um, and sometimes that's me um, playing the game. Sometimes it's me watching other streamers play and playing in their tr- chat. And, you know, there's this thing called assisted streaks to where you try and see how many countries you can get in a row um, as like a, as a team together on Twitch. Um, so it's like maybe me playing as being in those chat rooms or um, yeah. And then as far as like actually studying um, a lot more, you know, I'll, there's like flashcards, you know, different communities have, I'll read and just like study up on different th- roads and like things like that. Um, so these like rules, like Portugal and Ireland have the dashed yellow lines and like Spain has like the red circle sign and stuff like that. Yeah. There's, um, there's like different like infographics or I'm not sure what the word is, where it's like, it's like what color chevrons are in every country. So it's like, Oh, the black and white chevrons, Italy, Greece, uh, Switzerland. And it's just like visualizing those is helpful to where it's like color coded as their colors. Um, and then there's also just flashcards. It's like, Oh, you know, the, the A3 in North Macedonia has triple yellow road lines or things like that. Um, or you just kind of like, you know, remembering those type of things. Um, and then there's also, you can get down to the nitty gritty of like, like the thing I'm working on right now is Australia and Germany. So it's like, every German city has different street signs. Um, oh, so like wow. trying to remember the, the design of every street sign in Germany, um, or that's just basically just memorizing uh, street signs and what they look like um, in like versus, in Hamburg versus like, you know, Berlin. Yeah. So it's kind of reminds me of like high school where there's like each country is like a different class and you have to rem- memorize all the random rules for like chemistry, social studies, like algebra. You just like memorize stuff basically. Right. And then you're like applying them when you look at the map. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Well, here's the here's the website that you mentioned. I loved it. Geo Geo Hints. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just collections of utility polls. So for the listeners, this is a website called geohints.com. Yeah, which Trevor recommends for people that want to get in, involved. And I was like, who put this together? Like, who is collecting all these utility poll images? It's honestly the whole community comes together and okay. kind, of, kind of just aggregates them together. Um, yeah, that's like that site's great for like learning. Um, you know, you could go utility polls, you could go bollards, sign polls, back of signs. You learn everything. Um, so it's fun. There are some, uh, you have mentioned past, there are some uh, very specific things to each country. What are kind of like your favorites that come up to the country? Yeah, I think my favorite and most practical thing that I wish was more common or even common in the US is, I mentioned this in one of my TikToks before, but Hokkaido, Japan, North Japan Island has these... Um, like these pointers, these arrows that point down to the road lines. So when it snows, you can see where the side of the road line is. Um, and those are only found in high dense snow areas in Japan, mainly Hokkaido. Um, so like you, you don't swerve off the side of the road. Like that's something like, right. Like it's very practical, very yeah. practical. Like Canada should have those probably somewhere. Um, and so like, yeah, so like things like that, it's like, okay, if you see those point in those arrows, that's, you're going to be in Hokkaido, Japan more than likely. Hmm. Um, some different regions of different countries have different guardrails. Learning your guardrails is a big part of countries too. It's like A type versus B type. Um, and then there's, yeah, so that's one. Um, there's a, there's like a, a lot of different state specific ones. Um, like, um, back of, back of Oklahoma stop signs, there's different signage in like South Carolina. 
um, but a lot of the time it comes down to like license plates, like Vermont screen plates or, um, different things, wide lines, like Arkansas, Mississippi, Oregon, Washington have like wider road lines. Um, so it's like very, um, those are probably some of the ones off the top, off the top of my head, but it gets pretty, yeah. Pretty it's specific. Pretty into- yeah. Turner, do you have uh, questions around uh, the type of country types that he liked? Uh, yeah, I guess. Are there any countries that are just really hard? I feel like you did say this on another podcast, but any that are so hard and then any that are just like really easy, like it's you get it every time. Yeah, I, I, I've answered this question so many times and I always have a different answer because I, it's, it's <laughs> I actually have like, heard it. I've heard and read different answers. Yeah, I'm just like, I don't know the answer. I, I, every time I say it, I'll go back to my community and be like, guys, I think I messed up this answer. I'm like, I really wish I said this and said like, I said Russia was the easiest. I was like so embarrassed. I'm like, Russia's not the easiest. Um, and so I thought, I thought about this. I've given it some thought. I think the easiest is Netherlands. Okay. Um, oh, wow. Why is that? It's just the most distinct, flat, and obviously, or not obviously, but the license plates, the only country that uses yellow license plates on the front and the back of their other plates. Hmm. Um, so it's like super distinct. If you see yellow license plates front and back, you're going to be in the Netherlands. It's uh, probably one of the first things I learned on GeoGuessr. Um, and plus with the architecture, it's super distinct. Um, and you can just guess anywhere in Netherlands and get a high score because it's so small. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> that's true. So like that's an, you get those when you're speed running high scores, you're like, yes. Um, I would say on the, on the harder side, um, Indonesia. Like, so there's, there's ways like identifying like what, like where you are in the country versus like what country you're in. Um, so like, maybe Indonesia is really easy to identify. Well, maybe not since I thought it was Taiwan earlier, but uh, <laughs> the, um, Indonesia has so many different islands and different, it's so big, right? It's massive. Um, that it's kind of hard to tell where you are within the country. It's super hard to learn that something I'm, I'm working on. Russia is the same way. It's like, am I, you know, in Eastern Russia, like near Mongolia or am I, you know, near, you know, Lithuania? Um, cause a lot of times it looks similar, so, especially cause they use the same road lines and everything. It's kind of, mm. it's hard. Uh, I think you said similar about us too. similar thing where it's like, it's just so big. Yeah. And it kind of all looks the same. Yeah. And yeah, I have this like ongoing joke that Canada is like my downfall right now. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not even a hard country. It's just, I suck at Canada. It's like my, uh, it's like my Achilles heel. I don't know why I'm so bad at it. It's like this ongoing joke. Um, it's like a oh, new feet, not again. New feet. Uh, yeah. The new feet one kills me. Yeah. It's, yeah. It sucks. Cause like you, you guess like Manitoba or somewhere in the middle of Canada and Newfoundland's like oh, a thousand, 5,000 miles yeah. way out, like kills your score. Yeah, it's 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 jokes. Um yeah. So Canada is like kind of like my I, I probably should spend time learning Canada right now. And there's like an ongoing joke, Mike, but like part of it's like I don't want to learn Canada. It's kind of a fun joke that keep it uh, going. Yeah, it's like, oh I suck at Canada. That's my that's my niche. That's maybe we'll rub off on you. We're both Canadian. I think we yeah. mentioned that. So yeah. maybe this yeah. this will help. Just this, <laughs> this is yeah, this, this is talk. My... This will catalyze it. Um I had a couple more quick ones. Uh so the other one I wanted to ask was the well, Turner asked about the difficult countries. Oh, the gaming. So, then you mentioned that there's not the monetization opportunities right now because we're not giving up yet are not yeah. great right now <laughs> because there's a lot of cheating. So, people that haven't had the chance, a lot of listeners haven't had a chance to look at the GeoGuessr. So, it's all done remotely, I guess, now obviously with the pandemic. But couldn't you create like tournaments where everyone's in the same room where you could take the cheating away? Like, is this in the cards? Have you talked about this? Um, I wish that was the case. It's just so like, it's something like I've always wanted to do is like get everyone like on a land network, right? And just like game out. Uh, but the, the community is so widespread. Uh, like, yeah. There's like, so like, I could probably name five people in the U S that are like pro players. Right. Like it's very like, plus they're all like 16 and like, I got school yeah. And stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Hey, mom, I want to go to this tournament. <laughs> yeah. But it's like a bunch of like other, I guess it's like other kids. So maybe that's okay. Yeah. But it's like, I yeah. mean, yeah. I mean, I look at the Fortnite World Cup, and it's you know maybe it's, it's probably similar, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's um, the community is so wide. I mean, you, everything from you know Serbia to India to the U.S. to you know Singapore. Well, I'm gonna put Turner on the spot here because Turner's an investor by day, uh, TikTok viewer <laughs> by night. Turner, how would we turn geo guessing into a lucrative business? What are, like you're looking at one of the most viral, popular TikTok channels in the last six months? What are we doing here? Just yeah. total hypothetically. Uh, 
maybe a couple weeks ago when crypto was cool when web3 was cool we we do nfts of, of, of the of the or something um i don't know i wonder if you could do like just a subscription like a like a gated subscription type thing or something or i don't know like a streaming platform dedicated to it i don't i feel like the issue is like such a small market like I, I, you have to figure out how to make this like really sexy and just like like really hype it up to get a lot of people in like the, the spelling bee right like the spelling bee is like on espn like how do yeah, we the, get but it's this? like a it's like a once a year thing though it's like how do you get geoguessr how would you get geoguessr doing a hundred million dollars a year in revenue like i, I don't know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's a tricky question like yeah, dude, yeah. The, the first step would be probably making viral tiktoks that get people interested in it as a whole and realize it's a thing and then like start to increase awareness and adoption. I don't know. Separate subscription type thing could be interesting. I don't know. NFTs, whatever crypto stuff. There's probably like an opportunity. I don't know. I don't really do. I don't, I'm not very good at that stuff. I don't do. Well, much Turner, you brought up a great point though, is that Trevor, have you noticed more people joining the communities and being involved since you kind of went crazy? It's amazing. Yeah. So like one, having a following, I kind of underestimated Twitter as a whole. Having a following on Twitter, thank you, Turner. I gained like 15,000 followers in 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Um, you were like 100, 100 people or 200 I was, people. Yeah, it was just like me and like a couple of homies from my Discord just like <laughs> posting like absolute nonsense on there. Just like, and then I wake up and I'm like, oh, oh, I'll take this. Um, I was like, oh my God, a thousand. And the next, yeah, anyways, it's there's a couple of like, yes. One, I love getting like, I love seeing people outside of like the TikTok audience engage with this. So like even seeing people like, you know, the crypto community, the NFT community, like having like these, like, honestly, like high intellect people that are like engaged with their content and like think that of me and like, are, like it's, it's, a, it's, I don't want to say it means more. It means a lot that like, uh, I can reach people outside. And it's as universal as I presumed it was originally. Um, so yeah, I, I love like having this different community of type of people that are also engaging with the content now um, just because it's so different than what I'm used to. I think we can get Elon to reply to one of your videos. You did a Mars one, right? I did a Mars one, yeah. Yeah, I think we need to make that blow up because I don't know if you saw, but I, I mentioned this to Turner yesterday, but I don't know if you went through the quote retweets on uh, that viral tweet that uh, Turner did. By the way, for the listeners and viewers, Turner got 38 million, probably 40 million impressions on that now. Yeah, it was 40 million impressions on that tweet. It's absolutely it's like, bonkers. It's like half the Twitter user base. Who knows how yeah. big it is? Because like Elon's all like, oh, it's all bots. <laughs> but probably like half of them are real people. No, I think, well, I don't know if you saw this, uh, Trevor, but the head of Tesla AI retweeted the video with a comment. Did you see this? Oh, I saw that, but I didn't realize who that was. I yeah, guess. so he's the he's this guy is this guy runs Tesla's AI, what and he yeah, how crazy is that? And he's based so for the uh, listeners, I'll read it out. But basically, the head of Tesla AI is like, oh, I, I just found out that there's professional Google Maps players. I wonder if we could train like a machine learning algorithm <laughs> to do the same thing. So like, I, I think oh uh, well, I'll, I'll ask Turner because Turner understands both communities more. It's like. Obviously, TikTok, massive user base, a billion users, way more than Twitter. But to Trevor's point, there's just a totally different class of influential users on Twitter, right? Yeah, I think Twitter is more of like the intellectual class, probably skews a little bit older. Um, yeah. Like pro professional desk workers, like white collar knowledge worker, like the laptop class. Yeah. Um, like, like, <laughs> like journalists and things like that. Um, there's like the people that like will make fun of TikTok. Meanwhile, TikTok is like the most influential like internet platform like ever in existence, like more than Facebook. So it's totally different audiences that are probably like don't really like connect with each other. Yeah. But it's interesting that the content works on both. Like that's the crazy part. It's Trevor, have you had any, uh, I mean, feel free to divulge, but have you had interesting conversations from TikTok or Twitter from like fairly like, hyped up people because I've, um, I've seen publicly when you did the music video for one of the uh, artists they responded to you directly right yeah um so like usually every time i'll like find a music video i'll we'll reach out to like the actual artist be like hey we're doing this like you're gonna oh, love that's it smart oh um so that's what we do with like kaigo and kaigo supported it kaigo the person that was featured on kaigo's song supported it um so i'm making sure cool. you know once we're once we do these it's like you know i did one with like jeremy zucker where i found um it's like an, an artist where i yeah, it's good. It's like, it's a great publicity. Honestly, it's like one, it's like very organic. Um, and it's like very easy to interact with. And it's just viral content, um, to get eyes on people's 
yeah uh, music so yeah i'll reach out to all the you know oh you do you ask first like uh like just to uh that's very thoughtful right you don't want to give people a blast yeah be like hey maybe ask isn't i'd be like hey i'm doing this (laughs) if you want to support it that'd be great type yeah Uh, if not yeah yeah. but like obviously like i also do like research like make sure i'm not like like there's been music videos where it's like in their hometown or something i'm like okay I'm not trying to like dox this person's house. Right. So mm-hmm. I'll be very, you know, cautious. I'm like making sure this isn't like go back to them or, you know, um, cause that is like a, I don't want to, I don't want to do that obviously. So. Well, one, um, well, Turner actually sent me this question yesterday, so I'll just ask it. I'll just steal it from him. But my, I was going to ask you uh, a question regarding the most quote, liked quote retweet, which basically said that you were showing people how to become a stalker. Right. Which is kind of mm-hmm. whatever. I know that you saw that too, probably. But the the, the, the broader question, which is uh, another one that was very popular, was uh, people, what do you feel, and this is just a comment, not specifically about your video, but in general, of oversharing on social. It's like, it's stuff like this is like, listen, people can get found, right? Like, like what would be your response to that? And just maybe general uh, uh, <laughs> recommendation for the community and the world. Yeah, I think my first response is like, one, I... I'm actually glad. I, I'm actually really glad that this side of Twitter had like opened my eyes to this type, to where maybe normally I I never had really thought of it about in that way. Um, so like I'm honestly like glad that they opened my eyes towards that. Like this is people probably do this with bad intent. I don't do it with bad intent. I do this just because it's it's something I enjoy doing and I have a passion for geography. Um, but that doesn't mean someone else will. Um, so like one, I'm glad that I actually have this new like obviously I was always super careful around like what I'm doing and I was pretty cautious and, you know, cognitive of like posting streets and like someone. Um, but yeah, so that, and then as far as like oversharing on Twitter, um, or oversharing in general on social, I mean, it's actually, you can get a lot of information, like very, from a, very little things. Um, I'm a human, right? There's probably AI and there's probably so many different, th- I mean, Google lens now, you can use Google lens and you can probably, it can scan something and identify what that is a lot easier than I can. Um, so there's different types of like, you gotta be really careful. I know like I actually did a lot of research and like people with different people are saying like not posting where you are like in the same time and, and things like that. And I'm all, I'm all for that, honestly. Um, like I don't post on social media, like myself, I, I want, I don't leave the house. I sit here and look at Google maps all day, but like, <laughs> Um, if I was to leave the house and post something, I would probably not, you know, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I was to touch grass, <laughs> I would touch grass, post myself touching grass after I did it. So, um, no, I I'm all for like that kind of awareness, honestly. And I think my video, I know there are some people saying that, um, I'm like teaching people how to stalk or do different things like that. And maybe, maybe, but I think at the same I, time, I, I I'm just trying to play devil's advocate, I guess, but um i think it did bring awareness to like how easy it is and you know you should be safe on the internet um because it is a scary spot and there is people out there with bad intent even though i'm not doing that like there is people that that will so be careful for the record i'm 100 percent on board like when i saw those comments like bro come on man are you kidding me like you're just like this is all publicly available information you're making it clear to people that like you have no idea it's like when you're posting pictures with your kids and your family uh, my instinct is like, just don't overshare. I don't, I yeah. don't post anything. I mean, Turner's got two kids. I know every now and then we'll post stuff about our family. I very rarely do it on Twitter. Like my wife has an Instagram account that's locked. And like, I, man, the world's a scary place, man. I think you brought yeah. a lot more attention to that. Yeah. yeah I, that, I, that was actually, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, I didn't realize like the most quote tweeted like liked quote tweeted response it had like 157,000 yeah. likes which was like almost as much as my original tweet <laughs> yeah. was talking about that. I was like Hulk because like, I, I muted the tweet like pretty quickly <laughs> I muted it because I was my phone was blowing up I was getting it was getting quote tweeted at least once a second yeah so I, I had to I had to mute it so I didn't really watch and Trung like mentioned like I started paying attention to when you started talking to me about it. I was like holy cow this is like a, this became a pretty big deal. Um, but yeah, like that was like the biggest response was like that one tweet that was like calling that out. It was, that was really surprising to me too, that it was like, it's true. It's a really good point. Yeah. This was like, this tweet was also like the catalyst for like 20 people that I haven't spoken to in like, t- like five years. Been like, yo, are you Gio Rainbow? 
And I'd be like, what? And they're like, and they'd be like, and then they would send me the quote retweet of the one that went viral. I'm like, this is their introduction to me. Again, is this quote retweet. <laughs> but not even Turner. Oh, no. That's like Turner said, it's almost as popular as Turner's original. Yeah. Video. No one sent me the direct tweet to Turner's tweet. It was always that quote retweet. <laughs> Oh and so I'm like, oh my god! Like, I promise I'm normal. Well, I feel, I feel like that specific chain of events. Like mine was probably like, it started with like tech Twitter and like like finance Twitter, and it probably escaped more broadly to like, I don't know, like meme viral video Twitter. Yeah. But then that quote tweet probably brought it to like. I don't know. Like honestly, a, it's like, like political Twitter. Justice. Yeah, yeah like, social justice like, political Twitter. Yeah, so you, that like that that piece of content like just hit the whole internet over the weekend. It was no, it was truly insane, man. Is like yeah. the numbers on that. Well, uh, let, let's bring it on a slightly happier note. And uh, for the record, I agree with you, man. It's like it's pretty clear there's no negative intent here. And and uh, listen. I don't think anybody went out and actually learned, right? Let's not pretend like somebody went out and went to GeoHints and like looked at 30 hours of footage, right? A lot of these quotes like, oh, somebody could go learn. It's like, bro, no one is going out and learning. And if they did, they probably already knew about it. But uh, this is actually another Turner question, so I'm stealing all of them. Uh, Turner asked, what are some of the funniest uh, uh, responses you've got on TikTok? Or what, which ones come to mind where like you legit like just laugh when you read it? Because I looked at a couple, I got a lot of here. Yeah, I mean... I'm, stitches i mean you look at any top i could literally make it like a a google sheet doc right now of like how to get a top comment on the geo remote tiktok video with the same 10 comments uh can you find my dad bro turns his pillow cold uh no yeah. he memorized yeah. sand he memorized dirt yeah it's like yeah it's like yeah it's so many different things like bro saw dirt and said Senegal. <laughs> bro saw x and saw x you literally the biggest template ever it's like yeah, it's and yeah, those are amazing. Um, the, I laugh every time. Yeah, yeah the, the comments. I actually think this is a really important note on TikTok. Is the comments sometimes are what makes a video go viral? Oh um, yeah, or the community sure. behind the comments is what like because once you like see a comment, I always like those comments too to boost it to the top, <laughs> to where then people are more incentivized to like actually make those type of comments. Yeah. Um, so like that's all thought out. Um, but yeah, I, I think playing in like. I'm not gonna try here and take my take myself seriously. Like that would be really lame. Like I okay. literally have a passion for Google Maps. I understand that this is nerdy, <laughs> um, and so like I, you have to accept it and you have to play into the into the nerd factor. You have to take these comments lightheartedly, and it's like it's all fun, right? Um, yeah. So there's the comments. Those are my favorite. I I love the cheating comments too. I get called a cheater a lot. Like maybe like. Um, I don't blame them either, I guess. Um, if they want to come here, they can watch this beginning of this intro and uh, it's not. Um, but yeah, it's, I get comments where like, I have one where I was doing 0.1 second and I would look down to like visualize the image. Uh, and people thought I had like a tablet beneath me. It was like reading me answers. And so like, I had like a hundred comments. People were just like, bro's just reading his tablet. Um, so those are funny, <laughs> but yeah, it's all fun and games. Uh, so I have a question in terms of, so you've kind of gotten a progression where initially it was like identifying locations, doing in one second, one V one ing point one seconds, pixelated in point one seconds. Like, yeah. and then you're like finding locations in music videos. Like what comes next? Like there's probably other crazy things you can do. Like, how do you think about, cause you gotta like keep it going in a way you gotta like keep caught up with crazy stuff. Like what should we expect? Yeah, definitely. So one, I'm always trying to like, there's so much to learn. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll only get better if I keep playing. Um, so I'll continue doing like the 0.1 second challenges and instead of like 0.1 seconds, it'll be 0, 0.1 seconds, but, 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 mm. you know, so it's like continuing those is like, but upside down and blindfolded and pixelated. <laughs> uh, no, but yeah, so I'll continue doing those and push the boundaries there. Um, I think, as you mentioned, I'm trying to diversify my content, right? Okay. Um, so like, that's why it's like, I'll never post like two back-to-back -back 1v1s or like, I'll do it one challenge a week. I'll diversify it with like these music videos where it hits more, more culturally appropriate stuff and like hits different regions of different, even the meme video, the capybara video, that was a different bucket for me because usually I, I had only done music videos. Wait, that, then, was a, oh, that was a meme. <laughs> oh, dude. Okay. Yeah, it was Sorry. like a random, it was just like a random meme <laughs> that was going that. viral on TikTok. It was just capybara in the front seat of a car. And like, that'd be really funny if I found where this capybara was because um, it was just like so viral. Um, so yeah, and then I want to. There, I have like a bunch of different like ideas around. Like one, I want to travel. Like I'm doing this thing where I, once a month I'm randomly locating a 
playing a map on GeoGuessr and going to that location. Um, so maybe making more oh, travel nice. type videos around that. Um, going to like Colorado on a random 200 population town next or this weekend because I just saw it on Google Street View or on a game I played. And I was like, okay, okay I'm going to go one location. Can I, can I pitch an idea? This is like Mr. B status. You would need like a lot of financial resources to do this, but like you get kidnapped and they like take the blindfold off and you have to guess where you are and you do Yo! it different times. <laughs> yeah. That'd be amazing. Like, that's that's a haunted. great idea. Yeah. Like Mr. B side. <laughs> Mr. Like, B should. Yeah. This sounds like the next Mr. B spell. Mr. B did something. Wait, has Mr. B been kidnapped? They should kidnap know. Trevor. I'm down to be kidnapped. Honestly, if you see me on the streets, just. We can make some well, content. Trevor, well, Trevor, the other one, the other thing that I, I mentioned to Turner, but like Airbnb and you, it's just a match made in heaven, man. This is like, I don't know anybody Airbnb that is in a senior position and Turner might. Turner is much more well-connected than I am. But uh, I, I'm i just throwing it out there. We might have to speak this into the existence. I'm I'm open for anything. And there's so many different opportunities. It's so, um, it's so universal. Um, so yeah, it's... And plus travel, it's it's fun. Yeah, it's there's so many different opportunities. With Has it, somebody honestly. thrown anything out, uh, officially that you could that you speak about, or just want to keep that on the hush until it's? Um, I'll keep it on the hush. Okay, okay, I'll okay. Keep on the hush. You're gonna come back. You're gonna come back on the pod. But uh, okay, a couple more. Uh, I appreciate both of you guys for the time here. And Turner's got family life and stuff to do. I'm sure that uh, Trevor, you want to get back to geo guessing. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so my first comment was uh. The other popular one that I saw that I had here was uh, "Bro knows Victoria's Secret." That's yeah. a popular comment. <laughs> Bro knows Victoria's Secret. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and Bro drove the Google car. That one kills me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, the uh, the the last kind of questions I had. Oh, this was the question I had was um. So you mentioned a lot of the geography side, and uh, and you're learning a lot about the countries. Have you moved into learning about the histories of the country? Because I'm a history buff, right? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, for example, I know three of the top places you want to visit. You mentioned was Laos, Singapore, and Iceland. So Singapore has a crazy history, right? Yes. Have you started diving into the histories of countries? I, I more recently than than I have before. Um, yeah. I like as I'm guessing now, I'll just have like random like documentaries playing. I'm like <laughs> tabbed just because it's like kind of autopilot. You know, you're just like, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so where I'll just have like um different yeah i'm learning I, this is something i've never been good at uh like history like i've never i i want to be more educated on honestly uh, yeah. so i actually candidly don't know very much about besides you know basic high school history um from an arkansas education i i don't know if i uh i know as much as i want to so i'm, I'm continuing to try to educate myself you're young man you're young and yeah. uh you're gonna be able to do a ton of reading um i guess uh then wait uh turner did you have last question Last question. Uh, maybe. <laughs> you, have that, you have that one. You like, I think early TikTok, like all the early comments are always like, you don't do anything on a Friday night is basically what they, what they say. Have, yeah. So my question, have you ever done this? Like as like a party trick or like, as like a date, like type yeah. of thing? <laughs> yeah. Or no. so, so one not like unprompted. I'll be like, Hey, you want to see me guess Lithuania in 0 0.1 seconds? <laughs> yeah. Look at this. Uh, no, I, I get right. Like recognized sometimes in public and people like fact check me, uh, be like, Hey, like, I'm, uh, you know, where is this type thing? Um, like, Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but like, have, have I brought it up in conversation? Yes. Um, was it on your like, Tinder profile? It's, it's, yeah. It's like, I have like on my profile somewhere. It's like I get down geography. I think is yeah. what like my it's like oh, a hinge nice. prompt or something. So it's like a it is it's a conversation starter if they ever want to get there. But uh, it's it's quite the that, bold man. thing. It's quite the bold thing to start with. I think uh, I can yeah. identify anywhere in the world in one second. That's yeah, a pretty. That's a good. Send icebreaker. me send me another photo where you are right now. I'll <laughs> tell you that it is. Has anybody ever commented? Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that you have like the perfect name for this sport of geoguessing, like Rain Bolt. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah, I think no one knows. That's my last name. Um, I don't think I've ever said that like publicly. Uh, but yeah, Rain Bolt's my last name. I've used it, you know. It's a great. Incredible. Great work tag. by your parents, man. Great yeah. last name. <laughs> yeah, shout out to them. Uh, <laughs> All right. So, no more questions for me. Uh, but me and Turner did put together a couple of last uh, images. Uh, they're of McDonald's around the world. So, 
I'll give my best shot. Let's do it. All right. Can you identify the following McDonald's? Can you geo guess them, Mr. Rainbow? Here Let's we see. go. All right. Here's one. Okay. Oh, here's bro. A so this is what we like to call, you know, unofficial street view uh, yeah. coverage. So it's it's a different type of game, definitely. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, you don't have things like the car and like what what is covered what. I mean, this is pretty standard. I feel like this white sign right here on this building um, reminds me of like Spain or something like that. But yeah, I'm not entirely sure to be honest. Because you need the, I mean, it, it sounds like the roads and sidewalks and signage are huge. That's yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's Google Street View is like usually the, yeah, the expertise more than anything. All right. I got two more here. I got some streets and curbs for you, man. Wait, Trong, right. which, where, where was that one? Uh, Budapest, Hungary. This is actually is the last one. Oh, this is somewhere in the U.S. Okay, okay. Probably nice. Arizona or something. Uh, yeah, yeah you, there you go. Four times a charm. You nailed it. It's near Arizona. What was the yeah. giveaway for that one? Um, it looks like a capybara had most recently been there. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. It's just vibes, I guess. The deserty vibes. Right, and this- the telephone pole in the back helps. All right, this is not. This is actually the official last one, not McDonald's, but this is... Uh, can you tell us where this is? <laughs> Um, yeah, this is, um, next to the crater of, um, yeah, no, this is where me and Elon are going to be. Yeah. That's a tattooing <laughs> from star Wars. So they filmed that actually in uh, Tunisia, but, uh, oh, really? that's funny. I love that. I love that. Uh, I, I get it now. You need, there's certain things that, that have to be like uh, game legal, right? Like the street, the curbs and the signage. Otherwise you're just playing random pictures on my desktop. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a different. Like, I'll get DMs all the time where it's like, "Where am I?" It's like some random photo. It could literally be anywhere in the world. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm more than happy to like pull up my my street or like play a couple games on stream real quick because I can hook it up to my. Yeah, webcam. let's go. Let's do. Yeah, let's, let's do it, it, man. Let's get. Yeah. Re- uh, uh, I don't want. I don't want you feeling like you you got hosed here by coming on this show where we're. No, like- dude, it's all like that's part of it, you know. No, let's it's- pull it up. Um, so this is the main map of plate. I get asked a lot, do you just memorize every location? The answer is no. That would be a lot harder than actually doing it. There's, as you can see, there's 50,000 plus locations here. Um, so yeah, we'll play just standard game here and I'll walk through it. So immediately here, we're going to be somewhere in like Eastern Europe. I immediately want to go, we have winter coverage and then we turn to Gen 4 coverage, which means we're going to be in Bulgaria. Um, so yep. Yeah. Next round, we're going to be what? in France. <laughs> what just happened? Uh, this Look at round, the picture. I think uh, it's your picture. This, this should be Italy. Um, we have black on the back of the sign. We have uh, black, white chevrons. Um, yeah, it's still pretty. And if we look at the car here, we'll have a short blue front plate. It means it's Italy. I, this is such a di- I mean, it really does. The streets matter so much, right? Yeah. So this is South Africa, maybe Lesotho, Eswatini. This mountain feels more Lesotho to me. So we'll go Lesotho. I'm not entirely sure. Come on. It was Lesotho. Oh my goodness. Uh, this is Canada. <laughs> okay. This is the age old question. Can I nail Canada here? Uh, Wait, how do you know it's Canada? Uh, road conditions. And we have a single yellow road line in the middle here. <laughs> road conditions. Those <laughs> shitty Canadian roads. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Actually, hold uh, well, my my family actually has a, like a like a beach cottage up around Lake Winnipeg in in Manitoba. Zoom in on that that brown sign. It looks kind of like the sign actually that we use or that we had. We're next to to Peachland Lake. Peachland oh, Lake. there you're right. It's BC. Oh, BC. It actually says in the sign. Yeah, we ruined it. Oh, there well. you go. Well, this there is you go. my my saving grace. Does does yeah. that count? Like, does that count? Like, can you zoom in and actually read the sign yeah. and like the city? Well, oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so usually I'll play a game where it's, yeah, it's all, it's all fair. Obviously if you, you don't Google it. So this is yeah. going to be Malaysia, I believe. Um, it could be Borneo Island, Malay, which is this island right here. That'd be a poggers guess. Um, but yeah, I'll just go Borneo Island, Malay here. It was Borneo Island, Malaysia. So we had the double white road lines. Um, this is going to be Malay again, more than likely. Um, but this is an interesting, interesting thing about this is that, we're driving right. Wait, see, this is very interesting. Amazing. Um, I actually don't know where this is. I would probably go Malay or Indo. Um, and then I look at the telephone poles and mainly Malay has like a black sticker on their pole. Um, but I think these pole tops are more Indonesian. Um, so I'll go, I'll go like East Indo or something. I'm not entirely sure where this is. Could be Malay. 
it was uh, Sulawesi in Indonesia. So yeah, I'll play one more game here. This is the U.S. Uh, probably northeast somewhere. I, man, I cannot just how fast you're just. It was, no, it's the U.S. It's the U.S. It was, hey, the U.S. is the U.S. You know that we could count. Bro, those. bro saw dirt. Said bro it's saw, the U.S. <laughs> bro saw dirt. This should be like over here in Thailand somewhere where like the soil gets red. Uh, it could be Cambodia, but yeah. And then yeah, this should be looks like Mexico. Oh, so fast, man. Yeah. So you can see there's a there's a big discrepancy between like looking at McDonald's uh, that's like uno- unofficial, yeah, uh, versus like what I've like you know different things like that. But yeah. Uh, well, so- guys, thank you so much. That was incredible. Uh, uh, redemption. Uh, I really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I, I can sleep at night tonight. Yeah, now. I didn't embarrass myself. <laughs> in front of. But uh, so um. Trevor, where's the best place to find you? Um, well, more recently, you can find me on Twitter at Geo Rainbow, uh, TikTok at Geo Rainbow, uh, Instagram at Geo Rainbow across the board. Maybe more YouTube long form content. That's a goal here soon. Um, that's just Rainbow on YouTube. Oh, um, uh, like more teaching? Yeah, like just walking through, like even just like things like that. Just like, oh, you know, I'm in Malaysia because of this poll or, you know, different yeah. long form things like that to, you know, educate the mass. Yeah, and uh, and people here probably know Turner from his tweet. So that's at Turner Novak. Uh, is that that's uh, CK uh, Turner? I know. Uh, just a K. T U R N E R N O V A K. Okay. Twitter and TikTok. I'm not as a big deal on either, really, honestly. But <laughs> I'm like the, the the side, maybe like the second most interesting. Actually, honestly, probably the third most interesting person on this podcast right now to follow. So Trung, you have some good stuff too. I appreciate that, man. But uh, I, you know what? When uh, when Trevor drops his. Uh, Thing he's being hushed about hopefully we can follow up with him yeah I'll, yeah that'd be I'll amazing touch guys thank you so much man that was amazing sweet have a great evening all right welcome back everyone i hope you enjoyed that conversation with trung how fucking wild was that boys all right let's get straight into the stuff from this week uh, i'm going to give a very high level on what happened with celsius um jack's going to talk about web web 5 from jack dorsey we're going to talk about google ai situation um, so boys look it's been crypto crypto winter like very very hard it's all been pretty tough like the the telegram group people been sharing some funny memes and some funny um, stuff in there to keep us keep us alive but it's been pretty terrible um, like we did a whole episode on bear market we saw Terra collapse go to zero which was an incredible like in a terrible way moment felt like layman brothers in crypto and celsius right now as of today's recording uh, which is tuesday it's still technically around um but let me just share the announcement from them and I'll, I'll explain what celsius is in a second as well so let me just share my screen um can you guys see that here from celsius's tweet so it says celsius's network is pausing all withdrawals swaps and transfers between accounts acting in the interest of our community is our top priority our operations continue we'll continue to share information with the community more here all right obviously this is blown stuff up so a high level on what celsius is if you guys have heard of blockfi nexo or any of these platforms celsius is kind of the og one from my understanding they're a place where you can deposit your money, whether that's stable coins, ETH, Bitcoin, and a bunch of other crypto, and earn interest. And they were paying out, I think at the time, uh, 6% on ETH, which is actually higher than the staking rewards, which we can come to in a second when we talk about Lido, um, liquid staking. Um, but essentially, it was a way for you to save your money in a place that you feel is quite secure. I've used it in the past. They have a really good app. Um, every week, you kind of see transparently how much money you get. Now, the problem is, as we've talked about in the past, you have to think about where's this money coming from. And when it's 6%, not 700%, you feel like, okay, this feels like a, a stable-ish place. There's someone that I can speak to. I've emailed them in the past. They've, they had a pretty good reputation uh, for a long time. Um, but what started happening since the terror situation, there were murmurings on the internet, and we've shared these threads with each other, where people are saying how exposed were Celsius, how exposed were BlockFi, um, and all these centralized players, right? And and the, they came out and said, well, we're not really that exposed, we're going to be fine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that was just the first kind of um, scratching the surface, what people were worried about. 
Um, and long story short, people were doing these deep analysis of other stuff that they're exposed to and people starting to see they were being a little degen with some of that money. So that's how they make their money, right? They take the deposits, they go and lend it out, they you know, make 10% and give someone back 6%. That's how they're supposed to do it. Um, they also were VC backed, so they had a, they had raised a bunch of money. So maybe some of the rewards will Dude, come from one them as of well. the largest investors was the Cana uh, the Quebec Pension Fund. That's yeah, wild. Wild. I think they That's put four hundred million in their last round, and you know Canada has this conservative reputation, so it's like causing a bit of uh, a uh, consternation, a stir in Canada. Say, like, yo, these nice guys. Well, let me be clear. Quebecois are very different than the rest of Canada, <laughs> as their multiple attempts at separating from the country have shown. But uh, it, uh, it's pretty, that's what I know about. I don't know much else. The one thing I wanted to add, Bilal, which you probably saw, uh, was how confident the CEO of Celsius was even just a couple days ago before they suspended withdrawals from the platform. Did you guys see this tweet? Yeah, it's wild. He so, was kind of arguing with, with someone yeah, online, from right? uh, Mike Doudis, uh on uh, three days ago. So they suspended uh, withdrawals, I think, uh, 36 hours ago, but like 72 hours ago. Uh, Alex Mashinsky wrote, Mike, do you even know one person who has a problem withdrawing from Celsius? Why spread FUD and misinformation? Uh, so, man, these like, uh, same with uh, Do Kwan was so contentious on Twitter. It's like, whew, the, the clapbacks, man. The internet does not forget. Uh, one last thing I'll add is uh, I asked our friend John Wu, uh, had a growth from uh, uh, Aztec Network uh, for the listeners that were here last week. He was breaking down the open sea situation. Great dude. Uh, I just asked him, uh, hey, give me a couple of lines on what happened. And <laughs> this was his answer. Uh, it goes, basically, people gave Celsius ETH. They staked it. Now people want their ETH back. And Celsius is like, oh, shit. Because you can't exactly. unstake the ETH for two years. So uh, that's, that's a great summary. And he, he did a great thread. I can share that in the, the show notes as well, where he goes through step by step, which we don't need to go through today. But that is kind of the crux of it. There was kind of two parts. If you've given them ETH, they were staking it. A lot of it seemed to be on Lido, which is like the biggest place where people do something called liquid staking. Now, the problem is you can kind of do some stuff with that. But like you said, until the merge is complete and all that stuff, you're not going to be able to unstake that. So it's locked up. And now when people are t trying to get their money back, you're, you've got an issue. The second thing is they have had, like again, this is all alleged at the moment, so I don't know the full details. There's screenshots people are sharing from the blockchain where you can see that they're in certain pools on these big DeFi platforms like Curve, uh, Aave or whatever. Um, and you can see that they were basically buying on leverage essentially right like they're, yeah. they're leveraging all of their positions um degen i believe you said they're doing degen the, still some degen stuff exactly so that now like yeah so we don't have the time to go into every single part of it but the point being there's a bit of an issue here so they sent an email to everyone and basically said you're not gonna be able to take out your stuff they didn't give even a timeline right and obviously this is one of the biggest players um in the space so it's had a negative impact on on lots of lots oh, of crypto. other things. Let's zoom out. Let's talk yeah, about exactly. crypto. Exactly. So here, Bitcoin right? and ETH have hit their lowest, you know, numbers They're down. since. So I'll give you the number. Uh, late Monday. So we're recording um, afternoon Tuesday. Late Monday, Bitcoin hit as low as twenty thousand eight hundred, maybe even lower. Um, lowest since December twenty twenty. Down seventy percent all time highs. Um, ETH is down seventy eight percent all time highs when it hit the lowest point was at ten seventy five. So let me uh, I throw some questions just because Jack's been awfully silent. That portfolio is probably crushing him right now. I'm not too happy about it. But uh, the, the, obviously the Celsius stuff, not helping. Uh, Michael Saylor is under fire with MicroStrategy. Uh, he obviously borrowed uh, against uh, his Bitcoin holdings at MicroStrategy to buy more Bitcoin, which we've laughed about. But uh, he has a margin call where it's supposed to be more collateral at 21000 However, he put out a statement. He says, basically, they are confident and comfortable. Granted, this is coming from officially uh, from Microsoft and MicroStrategy. He said they can go down as low as 4,000. That's like the real, like, that's the end. Is basically how he's framing it. So, <laughs> I but, love uh, Jack's grin. I yeah. love Jack's grin. Well, I want to know exactly what that means. So there it is. <laughs> Jack, everything. Oh, and Coinbase laid off 18% of his workforce. So, like, we're... The, I, the whole this thing. This is the FUD segment yeah. of the new Crypto FUD segment. Crypto of... winter is coming. 
Uh, all this talk, Jack, on to you. You've been awfully quiet. <laughs> what do you want me to say, boys? I, th I think the, uh, I don't know, the terror thing. What? I don't even know the Celsius product. Is there like a return? Is there like an APY built into that? Blah, like a promise yeah. return? Yeah, but it dependent on what crypto you've deposited. So they, they had um, deposits. They also had loans. So you could borrow, you could, you know, keep your collateralized assets, take a loan out on it. Actually, really pretty good rates. Um, it was basically like DeFi, but a centralized version. So there's a there's an app and an email address that you can email and stuff like that versus like, you know, using a MetaMask wallet um, on one of those platforms. So there was always risk, like the old saying is, not your keys, not your coins or whatever. And that's exactly what's happening here is if you didn't have full custody of it, um, you might be screwed right now. We don't know the, the f finality of it. Yeah, I, f I feel like all of these products are like the corporatization of the protocol, right? It's like trying to build something on top of it. And there's like some element of like phantom returns or like it's predicated on the market moving in a certain direction versus like what the protocol actually does. So I've never really like, I played around with some of those things just to try and understand them, but always stop short of like putting a significant amount of money into them because I just don't have the conviction that what is being said can be fulfilled over the long term. Um, it's still like such a delicate dance between this thing being a like very nascent technology that enables like new technical experiments versus a place where you should park all of your or a massive portion of your wealth. And like, obviously, we've talked at length about this, like our different positions or our different uh, abilities to allocate to it based on like where you're earning money. If you're like converting money from a, a like state currency into this and then experiencing it go down 80%, it's a very, very different experience than earning Ethereum and earning dollars and like siloing those two approaches off. I don't know. I don't know if we, we like I, we'd have to catalog all the statements that we've made on the, on this podcast, but I think like the idea that like I think some of the positioning of some of these protocols is irresponsible in a sense that it's like such a tiny market, right? It's it's still an experimental thing. To you could you could also like say the opposite of that statement with how volatile um, like equity markets have been over the last couple of months. But I think what these things have in common is they kind of garner a different level of trust based on the messaging, based on the like allocation of huge funds. And I don't know, I think the, um, yeah, I, I, it always confused me where the yield is supposedly coming from. I think like the, the hopeful outcome of this stuff happening is like, you just go back to basics and like you have to build products, right? You have to build things that people will pay to use. And like Ethereum block space is a product. They sell, I don't know, 5 million bucks of it, 10 million bucks of it a day. Like, why do we need to build all these like brands and banks and shit on top and like have, well, you're essentially funding a hedge fund, you're, you're, yeah. right? Yeah. You're basically putting money with a hedge fund and thinking that they're going to outperform you. Versus what? like, I'm bet betting on like in two or three decades, the Ethereum, the Ethereum blockchain is powering like so many useful consumer applications useful or like a different the version. Here, right? Yeah, or a different version of the internet. And I've seen like, I've been exposed to that in a way that a lot of people haven't. Like yeah, I've definitely. like transacted on marketplaces that are native to Ethereum. It's not replacing my savings account. Like that's just not... I don't know. I think even for, even for somebody who's like very comfortable with a massive amount of risk, that side of it never, it always felt a little like 
I'm unsure how, um, yeah, this like this is not an FDIC insured uh, yeah, that's, situation, that's a key right? Part of it. Yeah. If you're if you've got your rent money in a in a protocol like that, yeah. But again, I don't know who's where the responsibility lies. Like if if there are like, it's obviously I believe in personal responsibility. It's your responsibility, but at the same time, the messaging around this stuff is so. Um, I don't know. It's so. It's that's the madness of the crowds, I guess. People kind yeah. of assume that, like, I think there's a, a bunch of examples been pointed to on Twitter in the last couple of weeks where people say, like, hey, I've found this thing, or I think that there could be risk of these guys being beyond their obligations in a couple yeah. of weeks and just get, they just get laughed at or they just get, like, um, ignored versus, like, I don't know. Like I said before, the protocol itself is where the value, like where the L1 of value, if you'll excuse the pun, is like, unless you can really demonstrate like what it is you're building on top of that and be transparent about where that value is coming from, I don't really understand so um, how you I, could attract an ungodly amount of capital. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. The only thing I would say is I'd point to some of our previous conversations about how the space will evolve and how basically we can't be expecting people to put a you know kettlebell with your with your with your keys that's on true. it underneath so that's one level uh, and so I I would argue that a block fire or celsius or nexo were creating that consumer friendly UI essentially um, which didn't really exist like a metamask wallet is not anywhere near it. well it, that's an opinion but for for my mum to sign up for an app and press a few buttons like she's used to doing and use face ID is very different to an email address versus like, hey, type write down these things on a piece of paper and if there's a fire, like you're kind of messed up. So like that would be the, my only kind of rebuttal to that is that they, that's the kind of value add they're trying to create is they there's this thing being created, this actual utility driven DeFi uh, world or whatever you want to call it. And they were giving access to people to some of those returns in a more user-friendly way. But again, the the risk was always, um, you know, like they're not FDIC insured, um, and, and you know that's basically the biggest one, right? And well, well, uh, they, let me rebuttal to you, rebuttal, because I love your point. I love where this has gone, because and I love that you pointed out how we've talked about it before, yeah. right? Because uh, we have many hours of conversations <laughs> about the crypto space. Yeah. Um, my rebuttal to your rebuttal is kind of meeting the two in the middle. It's just uh, because you have to be the interface and you're building trust for retail investors like your mom, even myself, right? I barely use as much as you guys do as far as like, you just have to be so responsible. You have to be so good and and don't get over your skis. And like, 100%. Right? It's like, I don't, again, I don't know. Did these people put it into D gen stuff? Like, were they massively leveraged and trying to make just a little bit of a spread for themselves or more than they should have? I guess we'll find out. Uh, and there's suggestions that that is the case. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you're, to your point, you're trying to onboard people. And this is why Coinbase, after everything that's gone on with them, there's a lot. They, they admitted themselves. We overestimated by quite a bit, like uh, how much runway we had, right? And uh, as like, a company in kind of this bull market and they've had to make some big cuts and obviously they've rescinded offers which is like man below you worked in big tech rescinding an offer that, to a big tech engineer is like unheard that of, doesn't right? happen right yeah yeah it, it like, could be like oh we have a hiring freeze but and we're not going to hire new people right if you've made an offer that that person might have moved moved across yes. the country like there's a lot of things that have happened i saw they pulled three hundred thousand uh offers for like product managers and like they have to like now what they're trying to do as a recompense to your point is like they're giving their lawyers to people that were going to come to the United States right on visas and can't do that's that that's wild yeah, yeah that's so sad, like, man. there's a lot of negative here like but like uh, what I will say about Coinbase is that they obviously spent a lot of time trying to interface with regulators right like that was kind of the entire pitch from the beginning for Brian Armstrong and uh, I don't know if they've kept that pace or if they're still on that exact track that they've uh, kind of set out the case with they're going to be the interface with the crypto world and like the existing financial political system. But I'll just tie a bow on this by saying to Jack's point is like, yes, there's personal responsibility, 
But the messaging, man, like, like you gotta, you just- They didn't stay true to their promises. Yes. Like their one line was that unbank yourself, always have access to your coins. But in so many words, right? right? So don't try to sue me for saying the wrong phrase, Celsius. But from what I've read, that was one of their, you know, they did the, the memes of like how it started, how it's going. And it yeah. was like, oh, we're promising this, whatever. And now the email of you can't take your money out. So I completely agree with, I actually agree with what Jack's saying as well and what you're saying. Um, I just would say that like there are legitimate reasons to create a better experience for people that like Coinbase is another example. You can go on a decentralized exchange and use like these native platforms and buy and sell different things on there, but they're not as user friendly as logging into Coinbase and they don't have all the legal things set up, right? Which we're going to Whereas need in Coinbase, as we've talked about, is also doing stuff with their reputation that are not great in terms of listings, right? Yeah. Like they're yeah. listing a lot of very questionable coins. Um, so let me, let me throw this in because I saw it in the Telegram chat. So why don't we put a bow on the crypto winter with this one how do you guys feel oh, okay first of all are you hodling that's the first question that we saw in telegram chat yeah. number two is how are we feeling about eth btc 10 years from now like what's changed if anything so uh, uh blah why don't we go with you first yeah i mean the the honest answer is yes i am still hodling unfortunately but <laughs> uh, i based well, well unfortunately slash fortunately because yeah. i'm sticking to the same thing i said six years ago whenever i bought the bought for the first time and i yeah it's always really shit when things drop 80 percent, of course but it's not the first time that's happened and secondly i we literally did this on the podcast and i i said oh i expect it to go down 80 percent minimum right and I, that's not me that's like if you just look at the numbers that's what's happened in the past previous bear markets yeah 80 to 98 percent depending on what you're looking at right and for me bitcoin ethereum i've always uh, to me that is my bet in on crypto and i don't think crypto overall is disappearing overnight i just think the price is not necessarily reflective of uh, what will be built potentially you could also say the hype of what happened in the last few in the last year wasn't reflective of what was built either right it was overpriced so that to me i'm not trying to separate like what is actually being built what is a long-term thesis is this going to be a new version of the internet or like are they at least going to be decentralized money uh, and you know all the hundred of things we've talked about on the podcast we, none of us know the answer to that it could all have been a complete hype right but that all the things i've now learned over the last two years uh trying to take away the the hype parts i still think there's something there obviously and for that reason i've stayed true to my original uh plan i did look at my finances and say do i need this right now do i am i buying a house like you know like jack we talked about it with the clicks to bricks and i have a few friends that thankfully sold uh you know in q4 because they needed to buy a house or whatever so i think like that forced kind of liquidation so to speak is maybe a blessing in disguise for some people for me it was i'm i'm okay with sticking to what i originally thought i did sell um a lot of like those shit coins and i did unstake myself i did put stuff in cold storage like that sort of stuff um and i kind of knew through that time like a lot of this stuff i know will probably go to zero and it was part of the budget like the percentage allocated was was proportionate for that reason um so yeah it's still really shit but i am at the moment still hodling until i really need to change like my life circumstances change then maybe that that will change but but it sounds like you set up in such a situation like it was responsible in the sense that you had a very clear bucket where you're gonna go degen yeah i mean responsible is maybe a bit of a stretch by this point but <laughs> but i think it's more like at least thought through and i thought many times like okay is this getting too big a percentage and it probably did in in hindsight but that was also because things grew so much right and um and i even at the height of last year i was like okay i'm still going to keep this for another five years so that's the plan and if it goes down to zero then i have to live with the consequences um and we'll get into this in an ama we're going to do for you guys but one of the questions was how has it changed today like what are you your actions and that there have been quite a few changes even on my side like the focus uh, for me anyway Jack, I got, I got. I mean, you know the the clicks to bricks story, which was a huge catalyst, not just for like, um, buying the house, but also like some forward insulation 
financially. Um, but I like part, a few of the NFT communities I've been a part of have been talking about this for a while. Like what all the catalysts are as soon as like the terror collapse, like we're, we're all like trading on narratives ultimately, right? Like these are risk on assets and the story is like reasonably bleak right now for a, uh, you know, it's going to take a, a period of time for that to recover. And I didn't really like, although I held through the last cycle, it was a very, very different time in my life. Like I had a, um, full-time job at the time. So I was like, Oh, that was, it's really interesting to experience two cycles from two different perspectives. One where you're like, Oh, I guess that's fade. I guess that's like fading away to zero and I won't have to think about it again versus a cycle that you participate in, you build things natively in, you meet people who are in the space who understand it much better than you do. Who you talk about it. it on a podcast every week. Right. <laughs> yeah. right, been through it three or four times. And like my level of conviction is way higher this time around than it was the last time. And I didn't sell last time because I was like, well, I'm in this at this point. It's like, it's not, it's not life-changing amounts of money to the point where you have like, you know, you change the directive of your f- of your family's life. It's like, maybe you live a little nicer for a couple of years, but it's not like, you know, exorbitant sums of money. And, um, that's still reasonably true relative to like business income. It's not like, you know, it's not like you could go and like live and never think about work again. So that's like my frame for it is it still has this outsized, um, there's this outsized upside that still exists. Um, And having more exposure to the ecosystem, I think is like, uh, just adds to my conviction that like the, the base layer of it is valuable. And there are like, we've just run these consecutive experiments on top of it. And it's almost, uh, it's almost a guarantee that the volatility of it gets more intense with time because like you're attracting more participants like there's more madness, like the, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but I think like DeFi participants versus NFT participants, I think there's like a, there's like an order of magnitude difference. Am but I, am I right in saying that? I don't you know. The NFT more? markets, like the no, NFT it's... markets are that much more, like had that much more consumer adoption that or that many right. more new entrants. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I don't, I don't. So it feels to me know. like each, each one of these cycles, there is like catalysts for, more like more people each time, which is going to result in these much crazier movements. And I like that. I definitely regret certain moments looking back and being like, this is obviously unsustainable and mental, right? Like this (laughs) is just way, there's no way this is operating from like, Hey, we're extrapolating future cash flows from this thing. It's like, we're in the middle of this, like, the most novelty, wild, outrageous thing. And I made some moves as a result of coming to that conclusion, but not as many as I probably should have. Jack, I don't know very many people that timed the bottom and the top as well as you did, dude. And let's be honest here. Well, I think that's another interesting thing is like hindsight 2020. Sure. Uh, like, but your instincts you know, were right though. Yeah, I, th- I think... Um, yeah, I think... I think it's really like fascinating to project out and how different, how different you can feel about, um, you can feel about the types of people that stick around each time. Like, I think, um, it's really easy to now see from each cycle I've been like adjacent to the first one, I didn't even know where to begin building anything in crypto or talking about crypto or knowing anything about it. I right? just like someone texts me. I was like, have you heard about Bitcoin? I was like, Oh, numbers going up. I'll get a little bit of that. Right. That was my first intro to it. And then just number went down significantly. And with that, like trailed my interest at the time. But when you get to the, the second time around, you just think about what, what it's up against. Like as a product, as a idea, the thesis hasn't changed at all. And like, this is not happening in a vacuum either. Like what's the, like 
the global like loss of wealth in the last couple of months like it, yeah it's, it's all and it's relative not just, to and everything it's not else just crypto as well right it's literally every asset with maybe it's, the exception of real assets. estate and that might not be for too long either who knows so it's uh versus like 2018 or 2017 18 like yeah the things might have dipped slightly I, I don't think they did actually like if you look at s&p 500 i think it pretty much just kept going um versus now that we've had a global pandemic record levels of inflation interest rates going up you know there's actually a real logic for why there's been a squeeze across the board and crypto in this case is the most you know on the curve like in terms of risk and uh, another thing trunks mentioned before which is um the amount of leverage that's used in this space as well right and that's what we're seeing the cascading nature of when something goes down and celsius needs to liquidate something and that is a huge chunk of money that then sells even yeah. more and we might see more with microstrategy with who, who knows um on the bitcoin side uh, we'll have to ask him at some point but yeah there's a <laughs> there's there's just like a it's just like a very different level of you know, like the, the industry is a lot younger um, and there aren't as many rules. So there's just the amount of things going up and down is is drastically different. Yeah, it's kind of like, imagine if you were betting like your net worth on one business. Like, I think it's no different than that at the scale it's at. I mean, it's smaller than like Ethereum and Bitcoin have a smaller market cap than Apple, right? Is that accurate to say? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is. It is. It's about yeah. half just so about if I was yeah. like but so i know people like, that are all in on apple right like uh, and yeah like, but it's I'm not sure. their checking account though you know what i mean like i think that's an interesting uh, right like parallel thought is like yeah we but like i think that's where like these products that do position themselves as like alternatives to savings accounts and use language that's like parallel with some of that stuff it's like there's we know you could look at one chart and be like, if my savings account looked like that chart, I wouldn't be having a good time, right? <laughs> I, I think that's that's I love the way you describe it. The the, yeah. the incentive for me to set to position it that way and to market it that way is obviously high. Yeah. But I think like more broadly zooming out, like what this technology represents, like um this is part of my objective as a visual communicator is to, and this is like, maybe this would be a nice segue to the web five thing is like, you have to start to articulate, um, the, the different models at play, right. Or the different, like what is fundamentally different about this technology and inspiring people to build around that in the same way that the internet initially became this, uh, you know, was looked at in its early days as this thing for like reading emails or looking up information. And now it's like this massive economic machine. Um, it's just a very, there's a very delicate balance because I think people are trying to build with, build products that have this like certainty element to them when the technology is kind of too nascent to make some of those promises. Um, and maybe, um, Maybe if some of those products were positioned differently, like some of the, uh, you know, like a USDC, for example, like I've had amazing experiences with like off ramps, on ramps. I don't know if you guys use AngelList, but you can like, you can invest with USDC on AngelList now. So like there are like these little integrations happening where way this tangible, way like a tangible yeah. uh, benefit versus like waiting five days for it to go from one place to another on the yeah. phone with your with your bank you like you do it in a few minutes yeah like usdc on ethereum is like the most amazing money product in the world in my opinion like it's incredible like that and that like that could be in itself like a single feature product yeah. right but i don't know that like it Someone's, so I read a tweet the other day. I haven't, uh, I don't know who to attribute it to, but it said like most of these crypto funds are just like sophisticated moon boys, <laughs> which I thought was like a class Great way to phrase. frame it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's like there's, there's this weird like chicken and egg. Like, uh, thankfully, we're not in a position where we're trying to get people to buy into a fund that re like requires us to like, well, not requires us to incentivizes us to generate a return. Like a lot of these, um, 
like this, the, it's the good and the bad of the permissionless markets. I think when like it allows like a bunch of innovation to happen really quickly, but it also allows for like outsized number of bad experiments to be run that create huge ripples and bad narratives. Um, but the, the long-term bet is that like the fundamental technical components are going to lead to way more valuable and useful products. And just like, think about the infrastructure of just moving value around. That is like every part of the global economy. If you're stripping out friction from the process of value moving around, you're like, that's one of the most valuable pursuits yeah. there is. Right. Yeah. And I think that is the, the deep down, that's the thesis that I believe in, but there's huge amounts of incentives to like act, um, to guess, I guess right now it's like, we, you know, Adam Newman territory in some cases and what's uh, Elizabeth Holmes. It's like, it's, there's a really fine line between um, making a prediction and speaking with conviction and building products and things outside of your control that you shouldn't be making promises about. Right. Yeah. That's a, J that's about as accurate as I can say it. Yeah, I just wanted to say the summary from w what you said there and from uh, just to wrap up on it. Um, the way I see it is th th all of this stuff, all this crypto stuff, there's two reasons it has gone up over time. One is utility, like actually creating stuff. Two is speculation based on hype and a story and a meme like we've talked about since the episode zero. The question has always been what proportion is it? on the pie like is it 10 percent hype and 90 percent utility or the other way around i would argue it's probably the other way around in most cases uh maybe bitcoin ethereum is closer to like 60 40 or something um and now I, and so like your example they're saying like taking friction away there's a clear utility there i 100 percent agree with in the same way i agree that apple google amazon and 100 other companies are amazing companies the question is always though the second question i ask is how much is, is that worth though and the valuation part is kind of where i think the market is deciding right now um and th so th long term yeah the idea to answer your question trunk the ideas i don't necessarily think have changed um but you, i have to divorce that from actual valuation and me putting a significant percentage of my own money into uh, into it as an investment um so yeah let me trunk, let me ask you yeah, answer my, i'll answer it then my, yeah i was going to ask you. because i've been like everybody <laughs> on this call and listening clapped really hard i probably had more <laughs> that i ended up putting more into crypto after like literally from this podcast when we started from zero with you completely guys moving in i probably put it up to a higher percentage than it should have been having said that from the beginning because i've been through a couple of cycles where i got spooked like as an equity investor and sold when i shouldn't have i'm just like i knew that i was going to hold so it's june 14th when we recorded this i still haven't looked at my actual portfolio this year i know that's very smart there is significant, <laughs> i know there's damage but a significant damage i just don't know what the number is <laughs> you know what i mean it's like in yeah. my mind there's like a band i know it's in a band it's massive it's probably more than 50 percent to be that's a little flex there from trunk yeah. it's massive yeah all right no 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 not massive by <laughs> I'm dollar joking, terms. I'm joking. I'm in a percentage term it's like in the around. negative way in percentage no term. i get you i get you man no i feel and that's exactly what i, I was just saying this this morning you know, once you get a certain uh, amount of money, essentially a twenty percent drop is a is a significant amount of money, right? Or a ten percent drop, and for me, it's probably way more because I was, you know, probably overexposed to this stuff. So anyway, I think we can wrap that up. But great, great question there, trying to to get a good discussion going. Um, I think we can probably wrap up real quick with Jack. Do you want to talk through um, high level on the on the Web Five stuff? So Jack Dorsey announced this. Um, do either of you want to give a summary? And I know Jack, you had some thoughts on kind of like why you think it should be positioned in a different way. Well, I can just like, I will first give a disclaimer that like I read that document and I'm like, I have no real idea <laughs> like what is being described here from a technical perspective, yeah. right? Yeah, I don't fair. know how this is going to work. I don't know. Um, like, and I've spent years trying to understand and simplify this stuff. And maybe I'm an outlier and everybody else is reading that document. They're like, oh, I know exactly how this is going to work. And I think just my, like, the broader commentary on it is like, 
why like Jack Dorsey is such a amazing consumer product brain, right? Like Square, Twitter, Cash App, like um, incredible products. Why is there not a like vision of this implemented? You know, like, and I, I understand uh, yeah. that, uh, like, I understand that maybe the vision is that the consumer product wouldn't look any different. It's just the guts of it that would function differently on like, uh, you know, a, uh, like your identity is attached to your Bitcoin address and you can port data in and out. Like, like my understanding of what it accomplishes is the same argument that is made for web three, which is you take your data with you and apps like tap into that and you control permissions. Um, and we speculated yeah. on it middle of last year with the, like Jay-Z, um, square culture all of this the idea of like they understand that cultural capital is a real thing and like building the infrastructure for that on a what they well bitcoin as this like permissionless network that um you can own like actually own your keys and you own the property that those keys have access to it's adding an identity layer to that. My, my like immediate questions are like, how do you execute that on a, like at speed? Because and, even like, even Jack, Ethereum to, transactions. Can I just on. say, sorry to cut you off, mate. I just wanted to make, because if someone's never even seen what it is, it, it, you were alluding to it there, but essentially a lot of what I could see in the doc they shared was, it sounds a lot like Ethereum, but based on Bitcoin as a layer one, right? Yeah, is that uh, they, what you guys got from it too? Yeah, I think the like they're calling it. Um, they reference the technology. Let me have a look. An extra like decentralized web platform is the tweet they shared. I'll just share a a quick like this was the uh, the announcement tweet, and then it is hilarious that they called it extra. Extra, yeah, it's pretty hilarious. And it's hilarious. It's a Google Doc. That that was another thing. So the web, very web two, but understandably that's what people are going to use right now. So there's a whole deck in here. Again, we're not going to go for every single thing. We can share that out so people, or you can just Google it. You can check this on their Twitter. Um, but this was probably one of my favorite things. It's kind of dependent on what, kind of similar to what you were just saying there. Jack, our boy, Mike Dowder said, congrats, Jack, you've imagined the world of Ethereum applications. Um, because this, like when I read this, it says control your identity, Alice holds a digital wallet. Essentially saying Alice, this uh, scenario, Alice can take her identity with her. Uh, using a wallet which is something we've talked about on the show before with ethereum login right is the kind of idea we explored um but yeah uh sorry i didn't want to cut you off i just want to make sure that if, if someone didn't know that already we kind of addressed it yeah yeah i i think um i think the like the big tension between the bitcoin and ethereum communities and why like there's like a difference in philosophy around uh how these ideas are implemented not necessarily how they work or what they're accomplishing but maybe the nuance is like people don't feel as though uh you know the like the bitcoin community celebrated this announcement after like two or three years of like shitting on the same functionality because yeah. it was built with a different philosophy so it's yeah. like it's the philosophy that people are bought into versus like the way it comes the way it's brought to market and i think the common i don't know enough we need to get somebody on to talk about this but like the the why don't you guys should definitely do that for next app do you want me to hit up that guy uh or we could we could try yeah maybe we'll uh, chat about somebody but, to yeah. basically explain, explain like in detail people people who look at ethereum as like a security right where there's like people that have huge amounts of equity and um, it was launched in a way that people don't believe is like as equitable as Bitcoin. That's how I understand. Yeah, they, the his issue. rebuttal is it's not as decentralized because once upon a time they reversed, you know, transaction right. and uh, yeah. whatever, which is you know maybe a fair argument. A fair point. Yeah, a fair and point. Bitcoin and, and, is probably more decentralized if you kind of plot it out on a graph. Yeah, and the, and I think the like the other interesting thing uh, is the speed at which, you know, people are trying to build L2s on Ethereum to fix like speed issues and Ethereum 
generates a block every 15 seconds. Bitcoin is every 15 minutes. So like using a web app, I, again, am like not technically qualified to talk about this, but that's the gap that I want to understand better. It's like, we're going to do this mm. decentralized open standard and Bitcoin is, is secure based on the fact that, you know, you have all this distributed computing power, but that also means it moves reasonably slowly. So again, I don't, I don't have the technical understanding. Um, the other critique I've seen of this is like, isn't that the blue sky protocol that's been attempted to be worked on at Twitter over the last, uh, Jack, however long. He just literally took that deck, reskinned it for a uh, block. <laughs> and, uh, let me, let me actually add uh, something that Jack or Jack has been talking about, and I think it's very salient to this point. Uh, Jack, you've mentioned in the past how Ethereum just has way more narrative momentum behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Because these, the, 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 the so-called uh, North Star for Bitcoin's <laughs> been achieved, which is its digital gold, being tested right now. But... Yeah. Uh, but I What's love to laugh, sorry. I was just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm you just were like, like laughing. You, you had to laugh as you said that comment because of digital gold. Yeah, it's being it's tested right now. Yeah. Um, Web five, I think, is similar in vain. And and we so listeners, we and uh, viewers, we will go deep on these with actual pros. I think Lightning Network is a very interesting thing. Uh, Lightning and TBD, this this project Web five, are kind of bringing that narrative stuff back, right? And um, that is what I'd be really interested in teasing out in the future. But the last thing I'd add, and I totally agree with you on this, is Jack Dorsey is such a consumer genius. They're releasing a Google Doc. Like, you're right. This should have been an app. How is this not an app that's already released, right? It's or even Google just Doc. mock ups of all the different applications yeah. of it, right? Where it's like, this is how it would work on Tidal. This is how it would work on totally. this thing. This is how it would work in yeah. this it's context. It's all conceptual. And again, like that this is where the problem is because if it is this new standard, the app doesn't look any different, right? It's just, you have to, you're trying to convince people of the philosophy by showing them a flow chart. And we're already <laughs> like at the saturation point <laughs> of people that line, care right? about flow charts, right? We're yeah. like, that's done. Like everybody that like <laughs> in the market today, at least like maybe, you know, again, these are visionary people. So 10, 20, like kids in school right now, maybe are looking at that chart. And I, that's the version of the internet that I want to build on, which incredible if that becomes the case. Okay, and I'm like, uh, like, let me, I have a dog in both fights here. So I'm not, I'm not in one camp or the other, but the things that this like internet, the things that enable an internet native economy, permissionless value exchange, all of those good things, like, Whichever horse wins that race, I'm all for it. Um, I think the other big point that we didn't mention is like the narrative that Jack's going up against is the token narrative. Like there is no token, right? Yeah, We're not that's doing, a key point. The, there is no token you can buy today that is going to get you the upside of this thing, which is obviously a conscious decision. They, they talked about that. Again, going back to the philosophy point, like that is a way, that, that's the narrative that Ethereum is fighting against right now. Right. And we've talked about at length on this podcast, it's like the incentive structure that come with like being able to like pull liquidity out of the market in like 15 minutes by making a promise that you might not have necessarily fulfilled on because of like the, the amount of desire to speculate and the infrastructure that's been built to speculate is very different than, Hey, we're going to build this identity protocol on Bitcoin. And the only thing you can do to speculate on the growth of this thing is buy Bitcoin and build native apps on this identity protocol, which again, very like simple and compelling narrative. I just don't have the technical understanding to know how long it's going to take for that to become a like I mean, I don't even know if the applications would compete with Ethereum. Like the applications they're talking about are like title playlists. Um, I can't remember what else is in the document. And and maybe that's like kind of the the um the, you know, feature, not a bug. Like it's not uh you know, if you create a like a culture around like the token the token issuance thing, then Obviously, put sugar on the floor. You, what was it? The Charlie Munger thing. If you want ants to come, put sugar on the floor. 
Yeah, yeah that incentive. idea. Like, yeah. that's yeah. where you get like Come Rocket and Shiba Inu token <laughs> and all this stuff from. <laughs> Because yeah. again, we talked about the John McCain Obama O's thing. Like the you raise seventy five million dollars in a day, and then you're just like, oh, if I'm anonymous, the best thing I could do is just do it's another just one of crap. those. Yeah, just just cash out, and I'll go and do another one. And and that like has encouraged an awful lot of terrible behavior. But and I don't know if that's going to change. Like it, people talking about regulation. We talked about the Nate thing last week which is like maybe people just like self-regulate if there are examples out there of just like people getting hammered for um f- fraud as john described it which i think was a great frame if you haven't listened to that episode go back is it one or two well, where we spoke episode. to john last episode i think that is like another foundational conversation to be had where this is the maybe the I'm thinking about this in real time now, Maybe like the protocol that Jack is suggesting, like there's way less incentive for you to like build a Ponzi scheme in that environment when you don't have the ability to create an asset and suck liquidity from the market using that device. So I get like, I, I really understand the philosophical differences. I think the question becomes like, which incentive is pulling in amazing talent to build stuff? And of the hundred like experiments that happen on Ethereum, you could almost equate it to like the experience that happen when people start businesses in the real world. There's like 90% of them just fail, but perhaps the culture around that is different because um, you're not in this like 24 seven, like yeah. casino environment where liquidity is just like flowing around everywhere. So it's building versus betting. That's what it is, right? If you're an entrepreneur, it's very different than a yes. number to go up. Yes. I, and yeah, we'll like, yeah, I would, I would, uh, like I said, I would love for that behavior to reduce in the ecos in the Ethereum ecosystem or for like a flourishing ecosystem to begin in, uh, in Bitcoin. But I think a lot of, even what gets people to start technology companies is this idea of astronomical upside, right? And, and all of this stuff is also tied to the macro narrative of the asset itself. So, And the other uh, thing is, Jack, I guess the, the, he's basically betting on people care enough about decentralization and these other kind of religious ideas almost. Uh, I don't want to say they're just religious, but you know, like if you speak to a Bitcoin maxi anyway, they, they'd really go on about about that part which obviously I, I care about decentralization too but maybe not at the same extent as a bitcoin maxi and i feel like the incentive part you just mentioned there with ethereum has its own problems uh, as you described but it also has the the positive side as you described all right boys that was a great episode thanks for joining us again let us know what you think about this in the comments below on youtube and uh, we will see you again next week cheers <laughs>